Hello, everyone. Are we getting close to time to get started? No one else coming in, so I guess we might as well. I've got a ton of stuff to talk, cover, so the, the sooner we can get started, the better it is. Everybody having a good day? Yeah. Even though it's early in the morning? Oh, le le sorry, let me try that. Everybody having a good day? Yeah. I love this. So my, one of my last presentations was in Belgium. You go in and you say, everybody having a good day? Silence. You crack the best joke you know, and it's complete silence. So I love the fact that there's some feedback. That's awesome. Uh, so it's topic of today is uh, authentication and a little bit of authorization in ASP.NET Core 2. It's quite an important part that it is actually 2.0 or 2.1. Uh, they rewrote the whole thing from 1 to 2, uh, and I will be covering what's in 2, which is completely different from 1. Um, so my name is Chris Klug. Uh, I work at the company in Stockholm uh, called 1337, where my official title is Ninja, uh, which basically means nothing because everyone is a ninja at our company. Uh, but I travel the world speaking at conferences, sharing knowledge as much as I can, um, and once in a while I do touch a keyboard and write code for real for clients. It's been a while now, though. Um, and for some reason I've got stuck with uh, doing a lot of authentication. I got a beard. Uh, I, I got stuck doing a bunch of authentication and authorization, and had to learn that, and it's actually it's, it's quite fun to work with. So I thought I'd go around and tell people how to do that and how it works in ASP.NET Core, because it's not that complicated, but it is quite important. Um, before we get started, how many of you are on ASP.NET Core 2.0 today? How many of you have not, are not on ASP.NET Core at all today? OK. So for those of you who are not on Core, core today, uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm showing uh, can be done in old, old MVC as well. Uh, it's different implementation-wise. You have to write slightly different syntax, but it is possible to do kind of the same things in a similar manner, but ASP.NET Core made it easier. So even if you're not on Core, you can take away a lot of information from this session. That's about all of the slides I had. Um, I'm going to be coding for the rest of the session. My goal is to do a very practical walkthrough of how we do authentication in ASP.NET Core. So I'm going to be showing you how we do authentication with local logins, how we switch over and start using so social logins, how we combine several different social logins, how we do Azure AD B2C authentication, and how we use Identity Server to do our authentication. And I'm going to do that all in 55 minutes. So it's going to be fairly fast paced. Before I forget it, though, I just want to put up one more slide. I generally have it at the end, but I f people are rushing out at that time mostly. All of the code that I am writing is available on the internet. So you can just go and download it. It will have everything you need except for my credentials for Twitter and Facebook. All of those credentials will be on my screen during the session. I would suggest not using them um, for my sake. Uh, and I might reset them afterwards. But th you need to make some minor changes to get it to work. And if you, you're interested in authentication and authorization and the stuff that I'm talking about today, but you're not doing exactly what I'm showing here, there's a course on Pluralsight that shows you exactly the same thing. 10 to 20 minute sessions on specific implementations. So if you want to do build your own authentication handler, there's a 20 minute module with that. If you want to do Facebook authentication, there's 20 minutes of that. So you can go in, find the module that suits your needs, and you can look up that stuff for that specific feature. Other than that, let's just go and switch over to my beautiful application. Um, it is, as you can see, a fantastic MVC application with um, Bootstrap. So it looks like every other application on the internet. Um, it's pretty simple. It has a, a home page, which is this, that says hello world, that's it. It's got a login screen. It's got a register screen. And it's got a secret page, which isn't very secret. But if you go to user info, you can find out information about the currently logged in user. And it throws an exception because it's not done. That's kind of the application I'll be using for the entire day or entire session. Uh, so I'm going to add different kinds of authentications to it. And if we walk over and we look at the code for it, um, look at startup here. Actually, startup is completely in uninteresting, but there's like we're using MVC and some static files. That's it. I have, in this case, I have an iUser service. So I have a little user service. And let's look at the implementation of the 
API for that. It basically just has authenticate, add, authenticate external, add external. Um, we're not going to look at the implementation because it's ugly, uh, but it basically stores the users in a JSON file on disk. Do not ever, ever do this, uh, but it's a demo. If we look at the controller stuff, there are some controls in here. There's an auth controller that has all of the actions that we need. So it's got login and register and logouts, which is the stuff that we're going to be implementing. And it's got an endpoint here called access denied. And I want to point that out because I'm not covering it in any detail. But in previous versions of Microsoft Authentication, a user was never put into a state of access denied. Access denied and unauthorized or, two, or uh, unauthenticated are two different things. So used, it used to be that when a user went to a page that they didn't have access to, they were sent to the login page. You could never go and say, I want to send a user that is logged in but doesn't have access to this specific feature to a specific page. They always ended up on the login page. There was no difference between being logged in and not having access and not being logged in at all. So they've added this feature where you can say, if you're logged in but you don't have access, we can handle that separately from not being authenticated at all, which is actually quite nice. Home controller is pretty boring. It has very little except for an authorized attribute. So I'm using authorized attributes. It's just the same as we would do in any old ASP.NET MVC application as well to make sure that the user is authenticated. And that is about it. A couple of views in here, obviously, they don't do a whole lot. Um, so if we get started, and I want to start out with doing local logins. So first of all, before I do that, how many of you are doing local logins today? You have your own credential store on-prem. How many of you are terrified that you have your local storage on-prem with user credentials? There's one, ha two, three, ha way less than all of the people that said that they had it, and if I had it, I would be terrified. Uh, but we still do it, and I still have stuff that do it, so I thought I'd start out in that end that we have our own login, or users, or user credentials in our application. So the first step to do is we go up to configure services, and we say services.add authentication. That is step one. That adds the authentication services to the dependency injection framework, or the ISA container. It doesn't add any form of authentication. This is just foundational stuff that is used to authenticate users. It doesn't have any actual authentication in there. What we get back from add authentication is an authentication builder. The authentication builder is something that we can then go and say, I want to add cookies. So I want to have cookie authentication in my application. That's it. That's, that adds a cookie authentication handler that is responsible for making sure that cookies work as an authentication paradigm in your application. And then that uses the foundational authentication services from add authentication. So in this case, we'll be using cookie. And we need to configure that a bit. So I'm going to add a cookie configuration. So it has a callback uh, delegate here. And you get an options back. And I'm just setting the login path and the access denied path. If you leave these, they all have default values. So I could literally just skip that whole thing. But you get some other URLs that I didn't find work for me. So I went in and configured it like this instead. Uh, but it does have pretty good defaults to begin with. So it does have things like cookie protection uh, turned on and, and all of the de standard defaults that you'd want to have for your authentication stuff. So I'm putting in cookies. And then I need to tell my authentication services what, cook, what handler do I want to use to do for my authentication. So every handler that we add to the authentication context has a name. If I don't specifically give my cookie handler a name, it gets a default name. And the default name is available under cookie authentication defaults. Cookie authentication defaults dot authentication scheme. So if we look at this, it's just basically a string that says cookies. But all of the different handlers, so if I'm doing cookie authentication, there's a cookie authentication defaults. If I do open ID connect, there's an open ID connect defaults. So the defaults, the standard is that there is a static class that you can use to get the default values for different things for that specific handler. So in this case, I'm just saying that I want to use the cookie authentication handler for everything. So whenever a user comes to my site, look at the cookie. Whenever I tell the user system to sign the user in, create a cookie. Whenever the user um, is considered not having access, 
redirect the user using the cookie authentication handler, which will redirect to auth access denied. If the user needs to log in, and I just challenge the user to log in, tell that cookie authentication uh, handler that it should do whatever it does to get the person logged in. So I'm defaulting to that for everything, which is basically everything we need. And that is, yeah, literally everything I need uh, from a service point of view. Did that, was that complicated? No, it wasn't complicated, good. Uh, if that is complicated, uh, it will get way more complicated throughout the session. And then what, one of the things I, I generally forget for some reason is you need to go down to your configure method and you need to do app use authentication. If you don't do that, everything works fine except the user never gets logged in, which is potentially not fine. But it, it kind of, there's no exceptions being thrown. It just, your application looks like everything works and then the user is not logged in. Don't forget that part, because that is the middleware that will actually make sure that once the request passes this middleware, the user is authenticated, there is a user set up in the system, there's a con user context that you can work with. And that means that when we get to MVC, the user is authenticated, so when we have the authorized attributes, that works. Once I got my services in place and my middleware, uh, I need to go over to my auth, auth controller. And here in my auth controller, I'm going to need to do a few things. First of all, I need to register a user. I don't have any users in the system, so step one is to register one. We look at the first action here, it basically just returns a view, so it returns the form to sign in, or sorry, to register. And if we look at the second register action here, it's an HTTP post, and the post here all it does so far, it checks to make sure that the, the model state is valid, basically that I have filled out all the fields that I need. Validation is sparse in this application, and by sparse I mean crap, uh, but I, I trust the people using my app to fill in everything. And then I use my user service, and I say, if everything is filled in, I'm just gonna add a new user with that name, that email address, and that password. And that gives me a user back from my user store, and this is where I need to go and do my authentication stuff. So I'm going to remove that, and I'm going to go and say register user1. So the first thing I need to do is I need to create a, a list of claims. So claims is the default way of doing authentication in ASP.NET and has been so for the last few years. Before that, we had I identity and I whatever claims principle, or I principle, it's all claims now. So I'm going to go ahead and create a claims list. So I'm saying that I've got a name identifier, I've got a name, and I've got an email, and these are the values for it. Once I've got that, I'll go and take my claims, and I'll use those to create a new identity. So I'm creating a new claims identity, passing in the claims, and I pass in the name of the authentication scheme that was used for this user to sign in. So in this case, cookie authentication. Then I take my identity and I pass that in and create a, a, a principle. And once I've got my principle, I can pretty easily, that's an extension method, so we need to add that. I'll just await HTTP context.sign in async and give that my principle. And after that, I redirect the user to user information, uh, the user information action on the home controller. That is pretty much everything I do. So signing async here doesn't actually do a whole lot, but on the way out, as the request goes past on the way out, the system will basically set the cookie and make sure that the cookie is protected and encrypted and signed and all of that stuff. And whenever the user comes back, after having been redirected to user information, as the user comes in, that request will have that cookie. The cookie authentication, or the authentication middleware would use, will use the authentication services to go and say, can you please authenticate this user? It looks at the cookie, rehydrates the cookie, and resets the user context, and the user should be logged in. And I'm saying should, but let's say and uh, see if it actually does. So let's go register. There it is. Uh, I'm going to register a user. I'm going to register me. So we'll do that. I'm registered, I'm logged in, I have a user. And you can see here it says that my username is Chris, fine. It says that there I have three claims. They're all issued by local authority. So it's issued by me. I could give it a different issuer if I wanted to. Here is the claim type. 
which is humongously long but, and makes the cookie big, but you can make them shorter and custom if you want. The name and the email address. Was that semi-understandable? Cool. Next step. Right now I can't sign out, or I can't log out the user. So logging out a user is actually as simple, if not simpler. So if we close this down and we look at the logout endpoint. One little detail here, by the way, I have an HD post. So my logout button actually posts a form. The reason for this is that I've, I've learned that certain browsers, Chrome, uh, will in some cases uh, prefetch pages for you to make your browsing faster. So it will actually go and prefetch stuff for you in certain scenarios. If your logout endpoint is a HTTP GET, it will go and potentially prefetch the logout endpoint, logging that user out of your system. So when the user clicks something, he or she will be redirected to that page and then logged out and have to log in again, go to that page after login, gets logged out again because Chrome is nice enough. So every time you click something, you have to re-log in. Not a great solution. Uh, I've not seen this happen a lot of times. It, it happens once in a while. So I'm just, for safety, I'm doing HTTP post. And what do we need to do in here? Well, we just need to do sign out user. By the way, never ever take on a project where you don't have pre-built snippets. It takes way too long. Just having pre-built snippets for everything makes life a lot easier. So what you do is you just say, await HTTP context of sign out async and redirect to action index home. Once again, this thing is async. It's probably going to be very fast, but it's, it sets up some stuff in the authentication services so that when the request goes out, the cookie is being removed because of the cookie handler. So this doesn't actually tie into the cookie handler at all. The feature I'm doing here, like sign out async, ties into the authentication services. The authentication service then looks at the configured handler for signing out and finds that I configured that to be the cookie authentication handler, and then it uses the cookie authentication handler to sign out. So I'm in no way tied in to anything specific, and I can switch things around. Using that, I can go back out here, I can press log out. And it logs out, okay. Fairly simple, right? Yes, Chris, that is awesomely simple, I know. Um, last step. Logging in. So I've got register. I need to get my login working as well, because I've got a user now. So we look at the login one. I've got the first action, which is the get, which gives me the form. The second action is my post. And yes, I do things like validate anti-forgery token, for example, to make sure that we can't do uh, replays and stuff like that. And in the post, I check my model state if it's valid. If it's not, I just return the view. Then I look at my user service and says, can you please authenticate this user? Here's the email address, here's the password. If I don't get a user back from my user service, I add a model state error, and then I return the view again with an, an error. And finally, I need to log in the user. Uh, and by the way, yes, this is the way it should be. You should not be throwing exceptions if the user is not available or anything like that. Do return null. Exceptions are slow, and it's not an exceptional state that people fill in the wrong password. Um, so what I'm going to do, actually, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off on that. What I need to do, it's actually going to be very, very similar to what I'm doing here. Because I've got a user, right? And this code here signs in the user. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this. I'm going to do that, extract method, sign in user. I have issues. I know that. So I'm going to have to move this to the end of my code because I suffer from CDO, which is OCD with the letters in the right order. Then you go up here, and we just do return, await, sign in user, user, like that. So there's no difference between registering a user or signing in a user. I'm doing the same thing. I got a user. I need to set the claims. Once I set the claims, I need to sign in the user using the HTTP context, and then I'm good to go. Having that in place, I should be able to, hopefully. That is not me. That is me. Fantastically complicated password. And it works. We've got login. So if we look at, the, just quickly have a, a recap of, of the code, we start up in start up. We, st we start out in start up. We add our authentication service. We configure the, the handlers that we need. And we add the, the um, middleware. And then in the actual controller, we just depend on the uh, 
HTTP context sign in async and HTTP context sign out async. That's what we need to do. And they are pretty self-explanatory. Sign in async takes a, princ a, a principle. OK, I need to create a principle. To create a principle, I need an identity. To create an identity, I need some claims. So you can sort of backtrack and figure out what to do. Um, but I figured out that all of my clients basically now want to have other kinds of sign in. They want to do social logins. Everybody wants to log in with Facebook or Twitter or something like that. Um, actually, but talking about that, how many of you do, if there's a login form on a, or a registration form on a website, do you, how many of you use Facebook or any social provider if that is available instead of doing a local login? How many of you will do a local login? How many, wait, keep, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. You have enough strength to keep your hands up. How many of you have a unique password for every website you ever go to? There are a few hands coming down. I must admit, I do social logins whenever I can, because I tr hear the entire sentence before you judge me, because I'm going to say, I trust Facebook <laughs> to keep my credentials safe. <laughs> I, I trust, actually, I trust Facebook in every single way. I will know that they will sell me out as soon as anybody will pay for it. Uh, but I'm also pretty sure they will keep my, I, my credentials safe. And also, because they have my credentials doesn't mean that they get to see everything and can log into every single application all of that. They issue a token, and that token is used by the third-party application. It doesn't necessarily give Facebook access to that application, and it doesn't necessarily give that application access to your Facebook. So I'm happy with that, and I see a lot of clients going towards social logins because it's, it's simple. So what we want to do is we want to go back to the start of class. I want to add another form of authentication in here. And I don't think I can do this easily, so let's see if we can do it like this. That's the one. So I'm just going to go in here, and I'm going to say I want to add some other stuff. So besides cookie authentication, I want to add Facebook. I want to add Twitter. And as I said previously, I, I, I mentioned the credentials. These are the ones that you will have to switch out uh, in your, uh, if you download the code. These are credentials. They are supposed to be kept safe and should not be shown to other people on a huge screen in front of 200 people at a conference. Um, I will reset these after the conference. You can't do anything with them. I've said that for the last five conferences. They are still the same. Um, but you can't actually do anything with them because the app on Facebook whitelists the URL that you can use. And it's hard coded to only allow local host. So in theory, you can use this, and just, but you can only do local development with my account, so it doesn't really matter. But please don't get your own one. It's, it's simple. So I, I add this in here, uh, add Facebook, add Twitter. And after that, that's kind of it. That's all I need. Then I'm going to go to my view for register. Uh, actually, I'm not. I'm going to go to my, that's not the one. I want to go here. I want to go to my login screen, sorry, to begin with. And down here, after my login form, I'm going to go and say, Nope. Nope. That's the one. Uh, external providers, that's the one. So first thing I do in here is I inject a service called iAuthentication Scheme Provider. That is part of ad authentication. It gives me access to all of the uh, authentication schemes that are available. In this case, Cookie, Facebook, and Twitter, because those are the ones that I have registered. And then down here, I go and say, for each scheme in get request handler schemes async, that method will give me back all the handlers that does redirects. So if I put in, it won't give me cookie, because cookie is local. It will only give me ones that will redirect to other services for sign-in. So in this case, it will give me Twitter and Facebook back. And then I create a link here and say, action is login external. Pass along the name of the scheme as an ID parameter. And the name of the button, or the, the, display, or the text on the button, is supposed to be the display name of that scheme. So basically, render one for each. That's fine. Uh, login external is not available at the moment. So if we go back to uh, auth controller, we look at login sort of here. I add another endpoint, login external. It takes the ID, which is going to be the name of the scheme that I want to use, so Facebook or Twitter. And then I go HTTP context dot challenge async. And I give it the ID. So I'm basically, this time I'm telling it that I want you to challenge the user using Facebook or Twitter, depending on what I've passed in. And then I give it what is called authentication properties, saying that 
once the user has been logged in, redirect to user info. If you do not do this, it defaults to redirecting back to the same URL or the same action, which means that the user, after having gone to Facebook and logged in or Twitter, the user gets redirected back to this endpoint, which then goes, sweet, you want to sign in with Facebook? I'm going to redirect you to Facebook. Facebook goes and says, you've already signed in, you're fine, I'm issuing a token to your system. S you come back to this system here, system redirects to this endpoint, you get redirected to Facebook, and you kind of get the whole thing that is going to suck. It, you get like 20 redirects, and then Chrome explodes in your face and says that you're a moron. In not quite those terms, but, but kind of. So I've got that going. All I need to do now is log out my user. Log out my user. And we press login. We press, look at that, Facebook, Twitter. Ooh, no, nope, apparently not. Go to Facebook. Ah. Uh, you need an internet connection to connect to social providers. Connect. It's actually kind of cool because you get to see that it's creating this massive URL at the top and you don't have to care, it sorts everything out for you. So all I need to do is get connected to the Wi-Fi. Those of you who are now torrenting stuff off wi wi internet, can you please stop? There it is, connected, open, go, enter. Enter. I end up at Facebook. I end up at Facebook. There it is. Uh, it, it says that Auth Demo, which is my Facebook app, wants to have access to my public profile and my e email address. And since I do trust the creator of this application to be an awesome guy, I'm going to say yes. So continuous Chris. Facebook issues a token, sends that back to the system. It sends it back to a custom URL that you don't see, but it basically has a different URL where it catches that, endpoint, that um, token. Uses that token to authenticate the user, creates a user um, identity or a claims principle, and signs in the user. And as you can see here, it has, let's see if I can do this, I get Facebook issued claims that says, here's a name identifier, which is the unique ID of me on Twitter, or sorry, on Facebook, my email address, my name, my given name, my surname, because those are the claims that Facebook will issue for me. If I do the same thing with, um, with um, Twitter, I'm going to get different claims, which is kind of annoying because we do end up with Depending on what I logged in with, actually I can show you that if we log out here, I could do login. If I log in with Twitter instead, so depending on what provider I use, I'm going to get different claims. So I go get here, I sign in. Uh, always prep your machine with your passwords. Screw that. Okay, so I'm not showing you Twitter, I'm, we're going to use Facebook. Um, if I were to do Twitter, you'd get different claims. Just trust me on that one, which is kind of annoying because I would continuously, my application, have to go, if the user has claim A, I can do this. If the user has claim B, I can do this. I would have to do that all the time. What we often end up doing is saying, I want to have a standardized set of claims, and potentially I want to collect other information than what I get from my provider. So I, I'm, it's very likely that I will be collecting information that my provider will never give to me. So to get that extra information or correct the information that you, you get from your provider, there's a, there's a pattern for that. And if we go back here, uh, we go back to the startup class. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here to the bottom, and I'm going to add another handler in here. I'm going to say add cookie again, but I'm going to name this handler temp cookie. So this is a custom, it's the same handler, it's the same code as this thing here. But instead of having this name, it now has this name. And then I go into my Twitter one, and I say scheme and set that to temp, temp cookie. And I do the same thing to Facebook. Because Facebook and Twitter will only authenticate the user. It will not sign in the user at, on its own. So what happens once Facebook, the Facebook and, oh, sorry, that was, it needs to go there. Um, they will only authenticate the user, and then they will go and say, once I have authenticated, please use this scheme here to sign in the user. It defaults to cookie. 
So that's fine. But in this case, I'm actually telling it that once you've authenticated the user using Facebook or Twitter, I want you to sign in using this thing called temp cookie. Temp cookie doesn't actually sign in the user at all in the system. It creates a cookie with an authentication, authenticated user, but it doesn't sign the user in because the system expects the user to be signed in using that handler. So it's going to be sort of semi-signed in using a different cookie and not really signed into the system. But there is still a user for me to access. Does that make sense, ish? We'll see when, when I start using it, I, I think it makes more sense. So what we're going to do here, so I'm going to make a little change in my auth controller in my challenge external. I'm going to change this and say, once you've registered or signed in on Facebook or Twitter, can you please go to auth slash register external instead, like that. And if we go down and we'll do that here, in register external, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll look at the HTTP context and say, can you please authenticate this user specifically using temp cookie? So normally, the user will not be signed in here, but there will still be a temporary cookie for me with a user in it. And then I say, if I didn't get a user back, basically the user hasn't been temporarily signed in, then, hey, just redirect the person to home because I don't want to I, I mess with that. Then afterwards, I take, uh, I take the, pr the uh, principal, basically the user, currently user, and I get the name identifier, my unique ID from that provider, and I ask, the authenticate external thing saying, can you please go and see if there's anyone in the system with this unique ID? If there isn't one of those in the, or if there isn't one of those in the system, so basically the user has never been here before, it goes and says, oh sorry, if there is one of those and the user has been here before, please sign in the user using this user. Otherwise, please go ahead and show a view where the user can fill out their name and email. This means that if I come back from Facebook, I and I haven't been to the site before, so I'm a new user, I'm basically registering myself, it will go and show me a name and an email field that I can fill out, and it will pre-populate the name and email fields with the value that is available in the current identity. So for Facebook, it means that the values will be pre-populated because I do get them. From Twitter, which I obviously can't show you, um, I will not get the email address, so I will only get a, uh, a name. And then the user has to fill those out, and they can change them and correct them as they want. And then once they've filled out that form, and they're coming, they're coming back, and we posted that stuff, we'll do sign in external, no. What I want, sorry, register external post is one I want. I got a uh, an action here where you post back your, your information, your username and your email address. Once again, I go and ask the system, can you please authenticate the user using the temporary cookie, not the real one? If there is no signed in temporary user, then hey, go back to home, I don't really care. If the model state isn't valid, which basically in this case means if they haven't filled out the fields, show them the form again. If everything is filled out, I tell my user service that, can you please register a new user in the system? Here, there's a claim called name identifier for this user unique ID for that provider. Can you please use that unique ID as the ID of the user? And here is the user's name and email. And it adds the user to the database with that name, that email, and that unique identifier. I'm somewhat naive here, because I'm just assuming that the unique identifier, the name identifier, is going to be different for all providers in the entire world for this user. They are not. because. Facebook is going to have one and Twitter is going to have one, absolutely. But it's very possible that I were to build an application that you could use for authentication that happened to give that identifier to a different user, which then becomes scary because it means that you will have two users being able to log in to your system from two different systems. And they're two different people, but they end up being the same in the system. So you probably want to have a little field here that says Facebook. So if the user has logged in with Facebook, here's a Facebook ID. If it's they've logged in with Twitter, here's a Twitter ID. If they've logged in with Gmail, here's a Gmail ID and all of that. And finally, I, I call sign in external. Sign in external is actually quite simple. It has two, two rows of code. It first, it starts out by saying, can you please sign out the user from the temp cookie? That will remove the temporary cookie, and the user is now not signed in at all. 
And then it goes and says, can you please sign in the user? And it just reuses the old sign in method to actually sign in the user using the proper cookie, the real one. And after that, the user is signed into the system. So if we save this, we go back here, we do login. Actually, it's nicer to do it in register. So what I'll do is I'm just going to go down here and say register. We'll do. We'll just do that. So I'm just dr drawing these out, the handlers on the register page as well. So if we go to register with registration stuff, Facebook, Twitter, I go Facebook. I get sent over to Facebook. Facebook then says, I already know who you are because you're already signed in. So I get single sign on because I've already approved this application for authentication. <sighs> there it is. Don't ask why. Um, and I end up at this page here, and here I can collect all these, I can get them to correct their information, I can get them to add information that's not there, and you can get them to put in their address or whatever you need. And right now, if I were to go to the home page or the user information page, it would treat me as not signed in, because I'm signed in using that temporary cookie. If I go and press register here, it then goes and, and registers me using the information in the temporary cookie, adds me to the local system, and it adds these claims here, and I get my default claims the ones that I want, and if I log out, and I go log in again, and I log in using Facebook, you'll see that it now corrects the claims for me. So I don't get the Facebook claims anymore, I get my custom claims instead. So I get this standardized sets of claims for my application. Um, okay, does that make sense? How many of you are in love with social authentication and will use that for the rest of your life and that's gonna save the world? A few, I like you guys. Um, for the rest of you, how many of you are using Azure Active Directory today to do authentication? How many of you love uh, Active Directory? There's one, two hands, okay. I thought I was going to show you Active Directory, but I thought I'd make, it, make a little twist on it. So I'm going to use Azure AD B2C. So Azure AD B2C is Azure Active Directory Business to Consumer, which basically means it's an Azure Active Directory, but then it's actually not an Azure Active Directory. It's kind of an Active Directory behind the scenes, but it's not being treated like one. Um, so you can't use it quite as you would with an Active Directory, but it adds features like social logins. So what you get is you get an Active Directory, and you get endpoints that are OpenID Connect specific, and they allow you to configure your service and say, I want users to be able to log in with local logins. I want to have users logging in using Facebook and Twitter, and I want them to be able to be registered their uh, user account. I want them to be able to edit their user account, and they take care of all of that. All you need to do is add integration with that service, and then they take care of logging in users, verifying email addresses, connect, collecting extra information, all of the stuff that I did manually in my previous version. So I have an AD B2C set up in the cloud, um, and it's configured and done. And I'm actually not going to show you that. If you want to see more of that, that Pluralsight course will, will walk you through setting it up as well. But I'm more interested in the client side, the ASP.NET Core stuff. So once again, I have a, an identical application. And if we look at that, it's a little bit different. Um, we'll see that in the, the uh, in auth controller. But once again, I'll go back to startup, because this is where I want to start. And we go into services. First thing, services.add. Authentication, step one. Step two, add open, add open ID Connect. So Azure AD B2C supports Open ID Connect, which is a standard interface for authenticating users. And I need to give it a name for my handler. In this case, I am weirdly enough going to name it B2C underscore B2C underscore one underscore sign underscore in and it needs to be configured. There is a thing with Azure AD B2C. It's the fact that it's not 100% OpenID Connect compliant. Because OpenID Connect builds on the idea that you can authenticate users, and that's all you can do. Microsoft wants to add other features to it, like editing profile information, and registering users, and signing up, signing up and, and signing out, and signing in, and all of that. So what they've done is they've said, we're going to have what we call profiles. So a profile is an action that I can do. So you can have a sign-in profile, a sign-out profile, sign-in or up profile, a edit account profile. Um, and those profiles basically defi define what the user can do. 
but you need to treat them as different endpoints and different handlers in your client, which is a kind of a pain. So the reason that I'm naming this thing here, B2C underscore one underscore sign underscore in, is because my profile in the cloud is called B2C underscore one underscore sign underscore in for the sign in profile. Chris, why the hell would you name it like that? I didn't. B2C underscore on one underscore is prepended by Microsoft for you. Why? I have no idea. But it's there, so you have to use it. So what I'm doing is I'm na naming my handler the same thing as my profile. And then I need to configure my options. But I'm going to have several profiles. So to be able to support that, I'm actually going to go ahead and say A, D, B, 2, C, con options, config. That's the one. So I'm creating this helper method here, and all it does is basically it takes the options parameter, the configuration, and the policy that I want to use. Then it creates the metadata address and says, you can find the metadata for this endpoint at this location here with the policy appended at the end. Then I tell it that here's my client ID, which you get from the cloud. I want to get an ID token. I want the user to be signed, in, signed out or redirected, sorry, to slash after uh, signing out. When the user comes back from Azure and having been authenticated, please redirect the user to this endpoint here. Uh, and when they sign out, please redirect to this endpoint here. These are endpoints that you don't touch. Th these are handled by the authentication system, but they need to be there. They need to have specific URLs and the end callback paths have to be unique per policy. So that's why I'm basically saying sign in dash OIDC dash policy name. And also the name claim that comes back from Azure has a different standard. So I have to say that the user's name claim comes back with a claim type name, not this HTTP colon slash slash blah, 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 which is that long. So I need to configure that. Once I got those configuration properties in place, I can go and say, configure OpenID Connect options, and I can pass in my options, and my policy, which is going to be that. So I've got my sign-in policy up and running. There are then two other policies that I want to have. So I'm going to go ahead and say, um, which is the one that I want? Sorry, uh, ADB to C, that's the one, sorry. So I create two other policies, one for sign in or up, which is basically a sign in form with a button that says register. And then I create one for sign up, which is just for registration. Make sense? Yes. OK. Once I'm done with that, I go and add ta cookie. All of these providers will authenticate the users. They will not sign the user into the system. You need cookie authentication to actually keep a persistent sign-in for that user. So I add cookie at the end. The authentication configuration here is a little bit more complicated, though. It's going to be ADB to see auth defaults. So in this case, instead of just passing in like I did before, cookie authentication defaults dot authentication scheme, I'm splitting out the different options, saying that when the user wants to, when you sign in a user, basically once they've been authenticated and the cookie authentic, or I'm, I need to sign in the user, use the cookie authentication. When you want to sign out, unless you specifically tell the system what provider to sign out from, sign out from the cookie authentication. If the user is going to a page where they don't have access and they need to be automatically challenged to sign in please sign them in and use the, the, uh, the handler called b2c underscore one underscore sign underscore in underscore or underscore up. You don't want to have that in a meeting. You want to have shorter stuff. And finally, auth default authentication scheme means that when the user arrives at the application, when the request comes in from his browser, please use this provider, the cookie authentication one, to, to verify that the user is signed in. So we can configure all these in different ways and have different providers or handlers or schemes for different things. In this case, the only one I really want to change is the default challenge one. And all the other ones is going to be cookie authentication. And finally, before I forget it, app.useAuthentication to make sure that the user actually gets authenticated. The services that you register up here doesn't actually have access to anything in the system. It will never know when to run properly unless you add this thing here that makes sure that everything works. 
So how do we do this if we look at the controllers? Well, first of all, my auth controller is way simpler in this case. There's only login, logout, and register, because I don't have any forms anymore. Microsoft handles all of that for me. This is all I need. So let's look at login. So signing in a user here is going to be A, D, B, 2, C, challenge. That's the one. And what I need here is I, I say, please challenge the user. And I want to challenge the user using B2C underscore one, B2C underscore one underscore sign underscore in, like that. And after the redirect, please redirect, or the sign in, please say redirect the user to user info. Same thing as before, the only difference is that I, in this case, have to specifically tell it what scheme that I want to use to sign in the user. We go to, to register. I do exactly the same thing. I send a challenge. But instead of sending them to sign in, I send them to sign up. And finally, signing out a user is actually quite simple. First of all, we do the await HTTP context dot sign out async, like that. That will sign you out from the default sign, in sch sign out scheme, which is cookie authentication. And then, nope, that's not the one I want. I want to have, sorry, adb2c sign out. That's the one I want. So here comes a little kicker. I need to sign out the user using the same scheme that the user signed in with. And there's a cool, and that's actually the reason that I name my schemes or my handlers here the same thing as my profiles in Azure. Because when Azure issues the cookie or issues the authentication, they will include a claim that is called TFP. The TFP claim will contain the name of the profile that was used when signing in this user. So by when the user signs out, I go and look at the TFP claim to find out what was the name of the profile the user used when signing in, and then I tell the system, can you please sign out the user with that same, with a scheme with the same name as that profile? Does that make sense? So if the user signs in using B2C underscore one underscore sign underscore in, they will sign out using that same thing. So if we try this out, you'll see how it works. We'll go register, because I don't have a user. There's a reason I don't do Azure demos anymore. I hate internet. So I've got different things here. I've got email sign up, we've got Facebook, we've got Twitter, because all of this is configured. I'm not going to do Twitter, but I've configured this in Azure, so they have all the information. If I go email sign up, I might regret this, but let's try it. I'm going to say chris at 59north.com. That's my address. No, I'm apparently not. I'm going to say chris at that's the one. Send verification code. I press that. I press that, it goes away. Scary thing here is if you're on stage and you start typing in your password field after you click that button, when the verification code thing pops up, it actually takes focus, so you start typing your password in that field in clear text. It is brilliant. I might have done that a few times. So we'll do password exclamation mark. And Microsoft is nice enough to verify my email address. So I need to pull up my phone, I need to pull out my email client, and I need to refresh my emails. Microsoft, on behalf of AuthDemo, your code is 019346. Verify code. Nope, I don't want to save that. And display name is going to be zero call. Create. So Microsoft handles all of that for me. They will do the verification. The whole thing that I input my display name, you can ask it to collect any information that you want, and they will make sure to add fields for them to um, input that, and they will make sure it's populated and all of that. So they will give you all of the UI that you need. And then I get logged in like this, and you can see it issues it using this issue. It's really hard to do that backwards. This issuer here, which is my endpoint, my Azure AD B2C, and I get the claims name identifier, I get an object identifier, which is the user's object ID in the, in the AD. My email, I get a claim that says new user, so that, that claim is issued when the user registers, so I can treat them differently. I get my name, and as you can see, I get a TFP claim saying the user signed in using B2C underscore one underscore sign underscore up. So when I sign out now, 
It's going to look at that TFP claim. It's going to figure out which handler to use. You didn't see it, but I was actually sent over to Azure AD to sign out there as well. So I do get signed out, disabling uh, single sign-on. If you don't want to have that and you want to keep single sign-on, you can sign out the user locally, and as soon as they click log in, they will be redirected and automatically signed it back in again, which is not what most clients want. Okay, you've seen Azure AD B2C. Uh, I'm a fan, but there are other options. Uh, one option that I very often put in is Identity Server. So Identity Server is a tool built by Brock Allen and Dominic uh, Bayer, uh, and it's kind of cool because you get an authentication provider, an identity provider, out of the box. It's a, it, you just get it off NuGet, you install it in your application. It doesn't have a UI by default. So if we go over here and we look at the, the code for it, by default you go in and you configure your identity server here to have like, these are the different things I want to configure it with, here is a test user, here is some identity resources. So all of the configuration that I need is, is being done in the services here. And then you just add it to your request pipeline by calling app.useIdentityServer. That will give you an OpenID Connect endpoint to authenticate users with. It will not give you a UI. So to get a UI, which is what I've got here, you need to go to GitHub and download it, and it will give you an MVC application uh, with the views, so you can go in and customize all of the UI of it and how it works and everything. So it's an ident external identity provider that you control completely. If you want to integrate with that, which is what I want to do. I've created another web here, so we'll go and set that as startup. Go control F5. Um, I'll go and I'll do the same thing as I've done before. We start up in startup. We'll do services dot add authentication. We'll go ahead and do add open ID connect, because that's what we're going to use for uh, the identity server, and then add cookie. For the OpenID Connect stuff, we want to have some configuration. So I'm going to put in some config here, telling it this is where you'll find the identity server, your identity provider, localhost port 5000. I'm doing it on HTTP, not HTTPS. If you ever, ever, ever do that, I will hunt you down. I will find you while you sleep and terrorize you like Freddy Krueger. It should always, you don't want to send credentials over HTTP, so you need HTTPS. I specifically have to go in and configure it to say I don't require HTTPS. I don't have HTTPS because I'm doing this demo locally and it causes some issues for me moving it around. But for everything else, leave that thing and use SSL. If you don't want to pay for it, Let's Encrypt is free. Start doing SSL on everything. I give the client ID, so the client that, that's configured in Identity Server. I tell it where to redirect after the user has signed out. I have this thing here, which is a, a bit of a weird one. Save tokens means that when the user comes back after having been authenticated, please save the original token together with this user in a cookie and have that for future use. If you don't do that, Identity Server, when you sign out, Identity Server won't actually redirect you back to your application again. It will just stop there because it doesn't know who you are. So the token that you get when you sign in needs to be passed to Identity Server as a hint, token hint when you sign out. Otherwise, signing out and automatically redirecting back to your application doesn't work. So this thing needs to be set to true. And finally, I have a, an events thing here, and I listen to on remote failure. So if something goes wrong while logging in, do this. Basically, redirect user to slash. On remote failure is the same thing as the user presses cancel when signing in. I don't find that to be a remote failure, but it's considered that. So if you don't add this, if the user goes and says, I want to log in and then presses cancel, your application dies. So you need this thing. We've got my cookie in there. I've got my identity provider, or my OpenID Connect. So what I need up here is IDS auth defaults. Do pretty much the same thing I did before. Set it up to use cookie for everything but default challenge. So if I go to a web page and it needs to challenge a user automatically, use the OpenID Connect one. As you can see, your OpenID Connect defaults just as with cookie authentication defaults. And finally, we need to go back in here and we need to say app.use authentication to actually enable authentication in our system. Once we've got that, we're, that's kind of the same as I've done three times before. 
And if we go over to auth controller, we'll see that I've got the same as um, with Azure AD, basically. I've got the login and logout. I don't have register, because register is not supported. There's no way to do registration out of the box with identity server. It will authenticate user, it will not register users. So I don't need a register endpoint, which is kind of nice. On the other hand, users can't register to my system, which is kind of crap. And in here, we'll do IDS challenge. Why did I IDS challenge, that's the one I want. So challenging is the same as before. I just send back a challenge when they want to log in. Challenge, send one. It defaults since the challenge default scheme is OpenID Connect. It will use that. And for signing out, I will just do IDS, sign, that's the one. Same as I did with uh, Azure AD B2C. First, I sign out my local cookie using HTTP context of sign out async. And then I sign out using the OpenID Connect one. And that will redirect me to the identity server to get a proper sign out there. Otherwise, you'll have sign single sign on again. With that in place, Control F5, got five minutes, I got one more demo to go. Application boots up, I press login. You'll see up here in the address bar, it redirects me to, it redirects me to port 5000, which is my identity server. I get this identity server for UI, which is a default one. As I said, fully styleable. Username, zero call, password, test, login. I get redirected back, and I have this user signed in. I have this configured here to issue my stuff as my identity server, which is not a great name. Uh, and you get a bunch of claims. Claims is up to you. So you define what claims the identity server should issue for you. You have full control over everything because it's your identity server. One thing left here, as I want to demo, is there's a spa in here. And by spa, I mean there's a JavaScript in here. I think that's what you call a spa, right? It's a web page with a JavaScript in it. Um, it is cool, it calls an API, and I call the API and I get ID1 back, that's fine. Because my API is in the same application, on the same port, on the same host, it means that it automatically authenticates the request using the cookie because it will send the authentication cookie to the API. Problem with authenticating using cookies with APIs is that we can get cross-site request forgeries that we causes problems. So what we want to do is we don't, when we're doing APIs, we want to make sure we don't use cookie authentication if they're on the same uh, domain. So instead, we want to use um, to tokens, JSON web, web token, bearer tokens. And to do that, we can go back to our startup class. We'll add another one of these. We'll do add JWT bearer, like that. Actually, I'm going to cheat. So we're going to do, to make this faster, ah, that's the one. That's the one, and I want IDSJ, that's one. So I'm adding another handler here saying, add JSON web token bearer handler. Once again, I tell it to not use HTTPS, don't ever do that. And then I tell it, you have to be, have access to API 1 to be able to access this thing. So I have another handler that will make sure that if that is requested, it will verify an access token that is being sent through a header instead of the, the cookie. If I go and test this now, it's still going to work because it's still authenticating using the cookie because my API, if we look up here, has an authorized attribute that just says, make sure the user is authorized. I don't care how, just make sure it's authorized. If we change that and we change it to authentication schemes and we say JDT defaults.authentication scheme, I'm now telling the API that only authenticate users Authorized users, sorry, authenticated using the bearer token. If I take this, I go back out here and I press call API. It freezes for a while and then it gets 401, unauthorized. That's kind of sweet. I get a 401. I've secured my API, but I can't actually call my API. Kind of sucks. So what we can do then is I can go to home, spa. I'm just going to quickly do this. There's more to know about this, but what I'm doing is I'm going to add a sign-in button and a sign-out button. And in my API here, I'm adding some functionality to sign in. So basically, when the user opens the page, I use a client library called oidcclient.js, which is written by Brock Allen, uh, which is an OpenID client for JavaScript. 
Using that, I can say, please go, when the page loads, please go and get a user, and it's going to look for a user in local uh, session storage. If there's not, no such user, it doesn't do anything. But when I call sign in, or click the sign in button, it uses the OIDC client to basically sign in the user using a pop-up. Sign out, sign out the user using a pop-up. And whenever I do an HTTP call, in this case I'll, I'll do fetch, I add a header here called authorization with bearer and the user's access token. So I'm using access tokens instead of my cookie, and if I refresh this page, you will now see I get a few buttons. If I call the API, not, uh, no access because it doesn't do cookies. If I press sign in, it's going to pop up a window. I get automatically signed in because I'm already signed in at the identity server. You don't even need the pop-up. You can actually do it silently so the user doesn't see that you're doing a sign-in as long as they're signed in on the identity provider. If I call the API, it goes ID1 because it's now sending an access token in an authorization header, and we got a token authentication. And even if I log out, I come back here, I look at my spa page, I'm still signed in because there's a cooked access token in my session storage that it uses to authenticate the user. And if I call the API, even though I don't have the cookie, I can still use this thing here. So we can mix and match our authentication as well. Having that said, moving your API to a different domain name or a subdomain is better for security reasons. But if you're going to mix, put them in the same, make sure that you have web token authentication on the API and cookie authentication on your, applica your web application. Code is available. There. Uh, if you have any questions, I will be around. Uh, if you have more, want more information, you want to see how to configure identity server, there are courses on that specifically. On that Pluralsight course, there's information on doing exactly this demo from start with all of the uh, configuration as well. Other than that, thank you so much for listening and hope you have a good day. Oh, if you like the session, please fill out an eval or drop a green note. If you didn't like the session, come up to me, talk to me. I'll explain why it was awesome. And then you'll drop a green note on the way out, right? <laughs>